On the phone, it is my pleasure to welcome back to this program. You know, I, I don't, uh, I don't want him to get a swelled head, but he's one of my favorite guests. Uh, I read his stuff on uh, Fire Dog Lake News every day, and always wonder when and if he sleeps. Uh, of course, I'm talking about David Dan. Welcome to the program, David. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for for joining us. Now, David, I I don't know if you're aware of this, but I I took like three days off last week. I mean, I, of course, pre-recorded, and I was working, of course. I Mm -hmm. never am not working. Uh, No. But I didn't do the show live for those three days. Uh, And then I had to, uh, I took Monday and Tuesday off for uh, family travel. And so um, my understanding is, there's a couple of things I want to get to speed. My understanding is that Mitt Romney uh, seems to be a, an incredibly bad candidate who nobody in his own party or his own campaign likes. And um, he also uh, basically puts, uh, I, I don't even know how to describe all this audio that's coming out from, his, um, from one of his big donors thing, but um, it's not just that he doesn't like, he doesn't think that he's going to get the votes from people who he thinks are, I guess, leeches in society. Um, he doesn't think that any of his proposals will help them either. Right. Well, with all due respect, I, I think before your, your five-day hiatus, we, we already knew that Mitt Romney was a bad candidate and, right. and uh, you know, uh, uh, uniquely unsuited for this moment in history <laughs> when, uh, you know, the, the time after a crisis caused by the financial industry uh, seems to not be a time when you hire the richest person ever to run for the presidency uh, as your nominee. But, um, yeah, with, with, with regard to this, um, this tape that has come out, that Mother Jones uh, tracked down, uh, it, it's, it's provoked a fairly interesting discussion. The discussion is actually more interesting on the right, because uh, as you allude to, um, a, a lot of the reason that we have the situation we have today where uh, federal income tax, which is, of course, one-third of all taxes that are paid. So the idea that, that you even isolate people that don't pay federal income tax uh, when there are so many other taxes that, that virtually everyone pays that are all regressive, things like sales taxes, and, uh, property taxes, local, state and local taxes, uh, payroll taxes, um, it is kind of absurd, but this idea that that you have forty seven percent of America uh, who don 't pay federal income tax uh, much of the reason for that comes out of policies Republicans supported and advanced and expanded things like the earned income tax credit, uh, the child tax credit, uh, ways that uh, t- uh, Republicans thought they could encourage and induce work. Uh, rather than, uh, I, I guess, welfare, um, by, through the tax code, uh, providing incentives for people that work to then uh, receive refundable tax credits in the form of funding. It's kind of a wage subsidy. Uh, so it keeps, it keeps wages uh, a bit lower uh, at the low end and, and can be sustained by the fact that uh, people who qualify get uh, uh, you know these these cash transfers that are that look like tax refunds, so that uh, you know tax lower tax is always good on the right. Uh, until now, <laughs> because um, we have this uh, this situation where you have Mitt Romney denigrating people for for becoming de- you know dependent on the state uh, through uh, this this factoid that is being sort of mismanaged about 47 percent of Americans not paying federal income tax. And so these things come into tension because what you're really talking about when you're talking about, you know, people who see themselves as victims and not taking personal responsibility and and the culture of dependency, what you're really talking about is you voter pay taxes and that other guy is making out with your money that you're paying into the system. 
uh, and that other guy is black. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in the most uh, 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 common version of this story, uh, we're talking about something that's race-based, that's, that's, that's class-based, and that's uh, based on, on this idea that, that has sold the Republican Party to the white working class right. uh, for some time. Well, and, and it's interesting. Okay, I mean, put that aside, because that is definitely a uh, an element of this. I mean, the other thing that is fascinating to me is that it is also an acknowledgement. I mean, there's two other things that it, that it seems to implicitly acknowledge. Uh, one is, when he says, you know, I got nothing to offer these 47%, right? Because I'm not giving, right. my tax breaks don't appeal to them. Because right. they're not getting a break on their taxes. Now, right. the story that we've always been told about why Republicans want to have tax breaks is because it's not because people are shirking their responsibility. It's because this will grow the economy. Right. Right. This is how we expand the economy. And if we expand the economy, this is how we take care of poor people. Everybody's boat is lifted. It's the whole trickle down theory. So Correct. he is also in this moment saying that stuff, that's all. Like, we just say that stuff. But we all know the reason why we give tax breaks is because people like tax breaks. Uh, and if yeah. they've already got them, then I've got nothing to give them. The, yeah. The I other- mean, that is why this has been more of an interesting fight on the right. Because that is sort of the Jack Kemp theory right. of how you grow the economy through uh, you know these tax incentives that uh, you know trickle down into uh, and, and rise everybody up, um, and and the fact that this uh, inartful or inelegant uh, comment um, really riled a lot of people on the right is because it, it does go against some m- measure of their fundamental ideology. But it also just shows, as I was sort of saying, getting at before, that, that their ideology is kind of intention because uh, it's just as central, if not more central, to that ideology to set up this dichotomy between makers and takers. I mean, uh, if you go to uh, my site and Talking Points Memo today, you'll see this ad from 1972 that Richard Nixon ran against George McGovern, uh, talking about his uh, George McGovern's uh, welfare plan, and uses the exact same number. He says, uh, uh, under George McGovern's welfare plan, 47% of America will be on welfare. Uh, and it's showing this picture of a construction worker eating his lunch and looking out onto the, the streets of New York, and the voiceover says something to the effect of, uh, and if, if you're not on welfare, then you're going to be the one paying for it. And that's been central to conservative ideology uh, to sort of pit the, 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 the working class against one another to see people as, as getting special, special breaks, special incentives, special uh, treatment. Uh, and and that, that has been their political strategy. What you're talking about is their sort of uh, economic strategy, their, their, their justification for this low tax mania. But their political strategy has really always been very much along the lines of what Romney was putting out there. And that's why it's so interesting, because it, what we've seen now is that those two things are just in fundamental tension. Right, and that's why, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to hear the presidential candidate say that. That's the right. chatter that we hear underneath where his surrogates say that, because him saying it actually really does sort of create that tension. It is much harder. I mean, it's, it's also, it also, you know, look, the story that we're always told, okay, by, um, and I'm veering into another story here a little bit about, uh, there was a quote by Ezra Klein in, the, uh, in a uh, story on Paul Ryan. Mm-hmm. The story that we're always told by those people who, the, 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 the establishment journalists, right. the supposed uh, policy journalists that um, uh, uh, David Broder sort of claimed he was part of, right? We're just talking about serious proposals for serious solutions. Right. Always start with the assumption 
that the two ideologies, as it were, the differences between the parties agree on some basic principles that they want to attain, right? That, 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 that no one should go without certain things in this country. And the argument has always been, what's the best way to get there, right? right. I mean, the Republicans cannot run on the idea, or in the past have not run on the idea of, hey, poor people, they deserve it. I mean, they can't explicitly say this, right? They, they, poor people, they deserve it. We don't care what our policies do to poor people, because if they're poor, it's their fault. No, this, the, 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 the debate supposedly has always been, we have proposals, they have proposals, we think this is a better route to go. This also creates that tension, and maybe we're just saying, this is a different way of saying the same thing, but this also questions that fundamental assumption. If Mitt Romney gets up there and says, look, there are 47% of the, of the population that don't pay federal income taxes because they're so poor, I, there's nothing I can do for those people. This isn't about those people. Right. You know, uh, it's, it's about the 53% that are left in America. <laughs> and I'm going to champion their, uh, 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 you know, their uh, hopes and aspirations. Right. It, it really sort of lays bare the idea of that, uh, th that we're all aiming for the same thing here. Do you know what I mean? That, we're, that, that, that there are similar policy goals, just different ways of getting there. And that seems also incredibly problematic. I think that's why sort of we're getting this response from even from people like Joe Scarborough and David Brooks and this and that who are pissed that, look, you, you know, either I don't know what's in their heart of hearts, but like you, that veneer is gone now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in some respect that, that, you know, these, these conservative columnists, people like Brooks and, and, and commentators like Scarborough, they created this monster. I mean, over the last several years, we've seen an empowered group on the right, uh, the base of the Republican Party, the Tea Party conservatives, who have definitely expressed this ideology uh, that, that you described, the idea that the, the, the poor deserve what they're getting and... and uh, whether they uh, live or die, I guess, uh, ma it makes no concern to us. And, and these, uh, this has become the dominant ideology within the party. And the people who put forward an economic program that was maximalist, an economic program that said the best way to go about economic prosperity for everybody is through our policies of low taxes, supply-side economics uh, that, that grow the economy and help everybody, and also empower people to help themselves, which is, of course, a core part of sort of the Republican mythology, uh, that if you don't, you know, make people uh, dependent on the state, that they become entrepreneurs and dreamers or whatever have you. So, uh, you know, the problem is, is that those people are gone from the mainstream of the Republican Party. Right. They may be there in sort of the, uh, you know, the economic policy fields, but uh, in terms of the, the core base of the party, uh, the, the, the group that put Republicans into the majority in the House, uh, that ideology is not there anymore. And 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 right. Romney, we call them. We call them. Um, we we call them former, uh, former democratic Republican establishment in many <laughs> yeah. respects. Right? We either call them former Republican congressmen or we call them, uh, uh, yeah, democratic uh, establishment. Exactly. So right. Erskine Bowles. Uh, yeah. So I think what Romney was doing was just sort of reflecting back uh, what he has heard over the last year when he's trying to run as the nominee of a party that now firmly believes uh, many of the things that he said in that, in that speech. And that comes not just from the base of the party, but clearly, be, given the audience he was right. speaking to, from the very top. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is, I would have to say right now, as I look out on the American landscape, I would have to say the most encouraging thing that I can say about it is that the a uh, huge money donors of the Republican Party seem to be as completely clueless 
and yeah. uh, out of touch as the uh, same guys will show up at the Glenn Beck rally. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I, I mean, th- this goes back to uh, something that was in Chris Hayes' book, which I'm sure you right. read. Uh, this social distancing that you get from elites uh, that, that live, you know, basically in their own bubble uh, and cannot relate to uh, the, the common struggles and the common problems of, of ordinary Americans, because they don't even see them. Uh, there was another quote happen. that hasn't gotten much play from Romney, um, a little bit, but not that much. It was the story he tells about going to China with a bunch right. of his fellow Bain investors. And they see the horrible working conditions of these people in China, and uh, they're told by the people who own the factory that, oh, we have gates up to keep people from getting in. The conditions yeah. here are so much better than they are anywhere else in China. Now, putting aside the validity of that part of the story, which may or may not be true, the lesson that Romney learns is, boy, everybody, if, you, if you're born in the United States, 95% of your work is done. <laughs> now, right. that certainly probably was his experience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you are born to the governor of a, um, of a state, or a chairman of a major car car corporation, uh, then yeah, 95% of your work is done. It's not quite the same for about 85% of the rest of the country. And and that obliviousness is the same obliviousness that we've come to know and uh, love of Mitt Romney. That's the same thing as like, look, take a risk. Borrow 20 grand from your parents and go out and... Make a yeah, man right. of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the other part of that, of course, is that it lays bare uh, the the bankruptcy of the entire "you didn't build that" comment, because right. implicit in the idea that you've done ninety percent of the job just by being born in America is that America and the American government offers so many opportunities through infrastructure, through education, through all of these things that it it helps people who do not have to be as self-reliant then uh, uh, to get ahead. Indeed. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? I mean, and and it's just a matter of degree from there, but the bottom line is, like, once certain things are taken off the table, uh, you know, some basic, basic things are taken off the table, you have certain advantages. And within the context of American society, more things are taken off the table for some people that has nothing to do with the fact except for... um, you know, uh, forgive the crassness, right. um, whose uh, who's body they dropped out of, essentially. And, You're right. and but, when. But, you know, also circling back to what you said about how this is true for some classes of people in America, but not everybody, clearly. Um, you know, I, I got really uh, annoyed by, uh, at the Republican, and particularly at the Democratic convention. Julian by Castro. By hearing Julian Castro, and not, not just him, but... but Virtually everybody talking about these these stories of how they they mm-hmm. you know America allows this opportunity society and 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 you can build yourself up through through hard work and and uh, and and all of the people who said that on on stage were the beneficiaries of that. But if you look at the reality, uh, Americans uh, I believe have the lowest social mobility mm-hmm. upward mobility in the entire industrialized world mm-hmm. uh, and it's just it's a selection bias it's such a low subset of people when you're hearing from politicians who succeeded on a stage at a giant convention say that we uh, think that America is great and, and we want to open up this uh, opportunity for everybody, but I, I, that, that's just not the reality of what it, how it exists on the ground, where your station in life uh, is largely determined by where you begin, uh, at, much more so than any other country in the industrialized world. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, uh, that was, um, I w- w- wrote that into uh, one of the pieces I did on, on, uh, on Chris Hayes' show this yeah, weekend. I know. Because, you know, it was, in particular, I mean, obviously... The Republican Party was wall to wall that, but yes. Julian Castro, in particular, uh, struck me as is echoing the exact same theme. Uh, in right. that, the subtext being that look, my parents or my mother, my grandmother, they worked hard, and look at where I am now. The subtext is, 
if you're not if you're not either eligible to be standing on this stage or success, you know, hugely successful, it, it sounds like your parents were just lazy. <laughs> and, they messed and up. The idea, you know, like I'm convinced there was more than one grandmother uh, of this generation who crossed that border, who did right. everything and had the same grit as uh, uh, Julian Castro's grandmother, but she crossed five miles south of where, uh, you know, a Julian Gra- uh, Castro's grandmother was, and she fell into a ditch and broke her leg and then had an infection. And, the, you know, like, the, or, or she ran into the wrong people. Or dumb luck, even, you know, aside from all the obstacles that come from people who are in that class, if you get out of the, uh, the, the lesson to be learned is not just that your grandmother was really great, she was also tremendously lucky. And, you know, if you want to call it grace of God or you just want to call it like, you know, I hit the lottery, um, that factor never came into play. The idea that it was just about that and that permeates uh, Romney so much. And it it also permeates a lot of what we hear from the Democrats. It it permeates the entire political class. And and it's uh, what's happened is, is that Democrats over the last several decades have have basically said that the only way we're going to talk about equality in an economic context, not, not a social context where they, they do, right. and, and much so, more so this year than almost any year in, at, at the convention, talked about social equality in, in really progressive ways. But as far as economic equality is concerned, the only way we're going to talk about that is in the context of equality of opportunity. You know, we will, we will provide the opportunity for people to succeed if they want to, and we will make it sound like this is kind of uh, a, a, a simple thing. If, if you work hard, you play by the rules, uh, we will provide the opportunity for you to succeed and grow. And look at me. I did it. I came from nothing. So if I did it, then certainly you can do it. Uh, what we've gotten away from is equality uh, of frankly, of outcome. Uh, The fact that if we live in the society we live in where most people don't progress uh, despite these alleged opportunities available to them, uh, that we're going to help them anyway, that they don't lose that that economic lottery and then have, have to be thrown to the wind. Um, well, and, one, of, one of the one of the major yeah. points of of Hayes's book is that equality of opportunity is sort of bunk, like it immediately yeah. gets corrupted, uh, yeah. like when it hits oxygen. You know, you can take it out of this sort of like hermetically sealed, uh, um, you know, idea chamber, but as soon as you throw it out into oxygen, it gets completely, uh, it gets immediately corrupted. I mean, one of the one of the things that the the producers on uh, on, on Hayes's show found was. You know, these ads from uh, Johnson and Johnson sitting there talking about the idea of people find themselves in situations through yeah. no fault of their own or through exactly. circumstances beyond their control. That, I mean, the idea of saying that there are circumstances beyond their control only applies to people who live in China relative to America, according to Mitt Romney, not within the context of American society. And just to fit this back to Romney and, and to look at that 1972 ad that I talked about, if you start talking about uh, these things in the way that Johnson used to talk about them, the Republican counterattack was, well, you're just throwing a bunch of people on welfare, you're making them dependents, and we're having to pay for all these people. And that was an effective technique uh, in the 1970s and, and through in the 1980s. Uh, and Democrats stopped fighting it. They stopped playing the game. They retreated, and they retreated back to this idea of equality of opportunity, and that's where we are today. Now, Romney, by saying such an extreme version of this, even though Democrats have largely walked off of this playing field, uh, maybe that will, will start sparking some sort of change here. But uh, what we have now... Well, part of the problem is, too, is that we're just yeah. talking about tax credits. 
Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. We were just talking about tax credits, and right. you know who's That's one of the biggest. Shifted. I mean, one of the in other. The, yeah, one I, of the I'm biggest. Sorry. One of the biggest benefactors of the idea of tax credits or choosing winners and losers in the tax code is a guy named Mitt Romney, who pays thirteen point nine percent taxes simply because of the fact that he gets other people to invest in product, um, right. and so therefore somehow. Uh, and really, actually, just into paper products, literally into uh, financial instruments, debt, uh, you know, loans, and he walks away with lower taxes because of it. Sure. I mean, the truth is, is that uh, he that doesn't context, pay any income tax either. He just pays capital <laughs> gains taxes. Right. He paid it on interest and capital gains and dividend income and things like that. I think he had a little bit of income the year that we know about because he wrote a book. Right. Okay. Uh, so, fair so he might have had some actual income that year, but uh, certainly not other years. But the, the point is, is that uh, if, if you really want to talk about takers in this society, you have to bring in these trillions of dollars in tax expenditures in uh, what uh, one, one author called the submerged state. Susan uh, Mettler, I think her name was. Uh, yes, People Susan can Mettler. search our archives for that interview. Yes. Uh, all of these things in the tax code that benefit uh, people who buy homes, that benefits uh, uh, people who put away money for their children's college, who have the money to, to save, you know, in Coverdale uh, uh, funds. Um, corporate welfare, uh, the 18 small business tax cuts that Barack Obama likes to talk about all the time that he signed. Um, all of these things. Uh, the idea that there's only a narrow group of takers, and that's the people who, who don't pay any income tax, is silly. I mean, everybody's a take, and, and some take a far bigger bite uh, when, they, when they do their taking uh, on the order of billions and billions and billions of dollars in tax subsidies and things of that nature. But you're absolutely right. We're only talking about taxes in this context, tax credits, whereas the discussion used to be about guaranteed basic income or wage subsidies or things of that nature. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, I didn't want to spend all this on Romney, so we'll just, we'll just try and... Uh, right. Well, let, let's also... He also went on to basically say some, I think, maybe, perhaps even more disturbing. I mean, they won't have the same political imp impact, but in terms of actually, like, sort of what uh, a certain subset of serious people in Washington will uh, sort of disqualify him from presidency uh, is sort of his stance on uh, Middle East peace. You know, right. he basically just said, like, I have no clue as to what our strategy is, and I'm willing to... I mean, I, I don't know. I guess maybe people take it less seriously because foreign policy doesn't, at least this day and age, uh, doesn't seem to sort of play the same role uh, right now in, sure. in, in politics. But... Um, his comments on on the Israeli Palestinian conflict, I guess maybe they shouldn't be terribly surprising from where he's been. But uh, th this guy is just—he just seems clueless to me. He like, basically said he's given up. Uh, that that Pal he's he's bought the idea that there is no honest broker on the Palestinian side. That that there is no one, uh, no leader in in Palestine that is willing to sign a peace deal in any respect. Which is a very easy thing to say because then you don't have to actually negotiate at all. I mean, you you don't have to pursue the peace process, which is very difficult uh, in any way, and and you don't have to uh, you know think about the the kinds of of steps that Israelis are or are not willing to take because well they they don't have a partner. So well, I mean, it's an easy thing for you and I to say, but if you're going right. to be the president of the United States. Right. Um, this is, you couldn't say anything that is more detrimental to peace and stability, at least in that, that the Absolutely. context of that conflict. I mean, it is basically saying, like, if I become president, I'm going to be in no position to do anything. Not just, right. you know, if if how yeah. facts on the change, uh, you know, on the ground changes, he's still not going to be able to do anything. He is. And if you're a Palestinian hearing that, what, what are your options? Your, your options are, well, we're never going to broker peace because the only group with the, with the institutional muscle to be able to, to force that uh, is the United States. And uh, their president or their president-to-be is here, sitting here saying, 
uh, you guys aren't interested in Islam, that's just not going to do anything. So what are the options for right. Palestinians? An intifada? I mean, there, there are no other options for them on the table uh, other than, uh, uh, certainly not through the, the channels, not that there are a, a vast array of options right now, given Netanyahu uh, being the prime minister, but uh, a, a, at least there was an attempt to try and, and uh, you know, getting back to honest broker, I mean, uh, that, that is supposed to be the traditional role of the United States, and here you have uh, a, a con- Republican nominee for president saying, you know, contradicting his own party platform, by the way, which does call for a two-state solution, right. um, saying, I- I'm done. Uh, all we can do is manage this. All we can do is sort of kick the can down the road. We'll just, we'll treat it like China and Taiwan, because, yeah, those are completely analogous situations. <laughs> because yeah. there are... There are troops sitting inside, uh, the, you know, the West, uh, you know, Taiwan right now. I guess. It's no, it's it's absurd, and it's it it is it is more of. I mean, it, it basically puts into context how irresponsible he was uh, in terms of the Egyptian embassy and the uh, Libyan embassy situation. It puts that in. It, it's now. It's like clearly, it's a pattern. In other words, you know, a president, a guy who thinks that he's going to be president should never, ever say there's no, even in theory, there can't be peace between right. the Israelis and the Palestinians because right. you're just, you're, you're, you've just created an untenable, um, you've started a war. Yeah. You, you, uh, and, essentially. And, and with respect to the, the Libya situation, I mean, one of the really interesting things that came out yesterday at the beginning of, of this uh, tape is Romney talking about how Reagan was able to use the Iranian hostage crisis to his advantage, and then he explicitly says, in, in some foreshadowing, if I have that opportunity, I will make use of it, essentially. <laughs> Saying that, that I plan to politicize any foreign policy crisis that happens between now and the election, and there he did right. <laughs> when there was uh, an actual uh, foreign policy crisis, an international crisis. He uh, put the accelerator on to try to exploit it as, as much as possible. And he did a, a really bad job. 